card number 10, we have Ordo Templi Orientis. Order Templi Orientis, or the Order of the Temple of the East, is a mystic organization that was started in the early 20th century. Now, the group supposedly relies on ritual and occult practices as a means for members to advance within the organization. The general philosophy was a new age esoteric principle and practices as a method of realizing one's true identity. Now, the popular occultist, Aleister Crowley, produced a lot of the group's material. And one of the major features and core teachings of the organization is a practice of sex magic. Ordo Templi Orientis still exists today with various chapters scattered around the world mainly in the United States and also in the UK and different parts of Europe. The Bilderberg group comes in at number nine. So of course we've heard of them before. Now it's not just a secret society per se, but it does operate under a similar type of mystery as some of these secret societies. So it's become the subject of many conspiracy theories over the years. Now the group was started back in the year 1954 and since then it has convened every single year as an invitation only conference of various world leaders as well as leaders in industries as well as many people who are prominent in the media industry. The group was originally created to prevent anything that would cause another world war to ever happen again and if it was to happen they want to subside the effects of it this has happened after World War II. But as time went on, the group became a lot more about how to reach mutual understanding between cultures. The Bilderberg group attracts a lot of controversy because there's no press allowed in their conferences, as well as a lot of the details about the topics that they discuss aren't officially released to the public, as well as there's a lot of security at their meetings. So it has people going like, what's actually going on inside of there? The American Mafia comes in at number eight, and I know this one doesn't necessarily sound like a secret society, but it actually is. They're a highly organized organized Italian American criminal organization. Now the mafia's crimes, secret rituals, and notorious members like Al Capone and John Gotti have fascinated the public and become a huge part of pop culture. During the latter part of the 20th century, the government actually used anti-racketeering laws to convict high-ranking mobsters as well as weaken the impact of the mafia. However, it remains a massive business to this day. Becoming an official member of the mafia traditionally involves an initiation ceremony where people have to perform rituals like pricking their fingers until it bleeds as well as holding a burning picture of a saint while taking the oath of loyalty. Italian Italian heritage was also a prerequisite for people to join. Although certain families in the mafia require you to just have Italian lineage on your father's side. And also men often, although not always, need to take someone else's life before they can even join the mafia. Now becoming a member of the mafia was meant to be a lifetime commitment and every single member had to swear to obey the code of loyalty and silence and they're expected to never assault any other member of the mafia as well as you can't cheat with another member's girlfriend or wife. Number seven is the Black Hand. Now we've heard of this in pop culture as well, but the Black Hand was a secret society that was started in Serbia back in the year 1912. It formed as an offshoot of the Narodna Adbrona, which is a group that aimed to unite all of the Slavic people of Europe into one country. Now their plan was to incite a war between Serbia and Austria, which would give them a chance to free their country and unite the different Slavic nations as one. And the Black Hand would be all but forgotten today if it wasn't for their involvement in 1914, where the group engineered the assassination of the Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand. The results of this were very catastrophic. Within days, Austria-Hungary had declared war on Serbia, and after the allies of both of the countries joined the fight, the small dispute, they actually managed to escalate it into World War I. And the aftermath of World War I eventually led to World War II, then the Cold War. So of course, this makes the Black Hand one of the most influential forces of the 20th century. Moving on now to number six, we have the Knights of the Golden Circle. Now the Knights of the Golden Circle was a secret society that flourished in the United States during the American Civil War. In the beginning, they encouraged the annexation of Mexico and the West Indies, which they believed would help the dying slave trade to once again start flourishing. But once the Civil War started, the group switched its focus to support the newly Confederate government. And then their organization soon had thousands of followers in the Northern states, and their secret society had an even bigger impact. All right, so moving on now to the last five secret societies, we have the Thule Society. 
Society coming in at number five. The group started in Germany just after World War One, and it began as a kind of German heritage group that really started dabbling into the occult, but it quickly became an organization that pursued to forward the ideology of the Aryan race. And it took an outwardly racist approach towards Jews as well as other minorities. Now the group had thousands of members and even had its own propaganda newspaper. So check this, back in the year 1919, members of the Thule Society formed a political organization called the German Workers' Party and the young Adolf Hitler became a member and he eventually took over that party and it became known as the Nazi Party. And we all know what happened after that. Next up at number four, we have the infamous Sons of Liberty. So the Sons of Liberty is the name of a group that existed in America prior to the Revolutionary War. Now the group did not exist as a secret society in the traditional sense. However, it was made up of smaller number of patriots from various colonies that united in the support of a common goal. Now when this group had met, it was usually in Boston around an elm tree that has since become known as the Liberty Tree. Now the group is known today for sparking up revolution among the colonists with protests of the Stamp Act. And by the way, the Stamp Act of 1965 was the first internal tax that was levied directly on American colonists by the British Parliament. Now, the Sons of Liberty in Boston were the most famous arm of the entire group. Probably the most famous event that they engineered was the Boston Tea Party in the year 1773, when the group dressed up as natives and they dumped shiploads of overtaxed tea into the Boston Harbor. The secret society at number three is Skull and Bones. Ivy League colleges are known for their many secret societies and student organizations and fraternities. And of course, there's Yale's Skull and Bones. They're probably the most well known. Now, the only real prerequisite for membership is that those who are initiated are to be campus leaders. So athletes and members of student councils as well as fraternity presidents are usually considered. Apparently, the United States presidents, as well as senators and Supreme Court justices, have been members of Skull and Bones. So not all of them, just like a lot of them have been. The club also is very well funded because an organization called the Russell Trust Association actually funds it. Now the Skull and Bones membership is no longer kept secret, but their practices still are. They meet twice a week, but what happens in the meetings are complete secret. The group is known for allegedly forcing new members to share their intimate stories. They also assign nicknames to every single member. We're getting to the bottom of this list and next up at number two, we have the Freemasons. Now, although they're less influential and secretive today as they once were, the Freemasons remain one of the most famous organizations in the entire world, with memberships estimated to be around 5 million globally. Now, the group was officially founded in the year 1717, but documents relating to their existence date back to even as early as 1300s. They were originally created to be a brotherhood where their members would share certain philosophic ideas, as well as share their beliefs about a supreme being. The Freemasons strongly promote moral living, and many of the chapters are heavily involved in charity work as well as community work. Now, conspiracy theorists have brought to light that they supposedly are involved in evil occult practices. Churches of all denominations have also criticized the organization as the Freemasons' teachings on spirituality and their beliefs are said to be an attempt to replace traditional religion. One practice, though, that they still hold to this day is how they induct new members. If you're initiated into the Freemasons, you have to be recommended to the group by someone who's already a Mason. And once that member is in, they need to pass three different degrees before reaching the level of Master Mason. And our members also have certain handshakes and gestures and passwords that they use to communicate between each other and also non-Masons are not allowed to attend their meetings. And finally, we've reached to number one. You guys probably guessed this already. Number one is the Illuminati. Now this organization has become the most famous secret society, mainly because of their frequent mentions and appearances in books, movies, and in TV. And now the legend surrounding the Illuminati dates back to a real organization that existed in Germany in the late 1700s. At the time, the members of the group presented themselves as an order of enlightened free thinkers. They quickly began to be viewed as a threat to overthrow the government, and they were even said to be behind the French Revolution. Now the group broke up shortly afterwards and they've been rumored to still be operating somewhere 
but in the shadows. Thanks to appearing in pop culture so much, the Illuminati has continued to be a topic of fear for many people to this day. It's believed that the group has survived and now directs the politics and industry of the world to a large extent. First up, the Illuminati is a name given to several groups, both real as well as fictitious groups. Now historically the name usually refers to the Bavarian Illuminati and that's what we're going to be talking about the most in this episode. Bavaria by the way is a state in southeastern Germany. Now the reason why I say that this name can apply to several groups is because what the term Illuminati actually means. It's a Latin word for enlightened and this usually applies to groups that believe that they have some sort of secret or superior or special knowledge whether that's spiritual or scientific or otherwise and that knowledge would be the source of the enlightenment therefore the term can be applied to various groups so in effect there can be multiple illuminati so how did the illuminati start anyways well since ancient times groups have been claiming to have some sort of special knowledge and johann adam weishaupt who was born in 1748 was a german philosopher and the founder of the Order of the Illuminati. Now this goes back to the first fact that I shared. Johann Weishaupt, he was a former Jesuit. And by the way, the Jesuit Order, or the Society of Jesus as they're called, is a religious order in the Catholic Church. Now on May 1st, 1776, Johann Adam Weishaupt, he formed the Illuminati. Now after the suppression of Weishaupt's order, the title Illuminati was given to the French Martinists, which was a group that was found in 1754 by Martin Pas and the ideas of the group was propagated by Louis Claude de Saint Martin. And by 1790, Martinism had been spread to Russia by Johann George Swartz and Nikolai Novikov. But if this is public knowledge, why all the secrecy and mystery around the Illuminati today and so much speculation on whether or not they actually exist? Well, the Illuminati is a secret organization today because it was actually outlawed. So in June of 1784, Bavarian ruler Karl Theodor, he banned and all secret societies and the government started to uncover various members of the Illuminati which caused Johann Weishaupt to go into hiding. So although it originated over in Germany during the Enlightenment period as it's called, conservative politicians feared that the concept of organizations like the Illuminati would uprise against the government. But when you have such a solid network established, of course you want it to continue, right? And a handful of later organizations claimed to be descendants from the original Illuminati, but it's believed that the original Bavarian Illuminati may have morphed and evolved into smaller groups since then, taking on various forms which allows them to operate in secrecy since no one can point to one specific organization and say, oh, you are the Illuminati. Then again, these groups could just be all copycat groups. Or does the original Illuminati live on? There's also a secret lingo, and this language is used through pictures, through the media, as well as even structures of buildings that the Illuminati, as well as other groups, use. One of these images is on the American $1 bill. This is what you'll see. The pyramid with a capstone at the top in the form of an all-seeing eye, and this stems back to the Eye of Osiris and the Eye of Ra in ancient Egypt. Now, wherever this eye appears, it actually represents the Eye of God, who knows all and sees all. Now, there is this book called Codex Magica, and it was published in 2005 by Tex Mars and it contains over 1,000 actual photos and illustrations. In the book you'll see world leaders and politicians and celebrities performing certain sign signals as well as you'll see the use of coded images. And this is common in all forms of societies, even university fraternities for example, like members have different handshakes and certain things that are just used among themselves. So these hand gestures and symbols aren't necessarily evil or anything, but this is why it's believed that the Illuminati have a secret language that people are actually using all around us, whether we know it or recognize it or not. They're communicating through the media. So another question is, uh, why does the Illuminati value secrecy so much? Why all the mystery and the encoded signs and handshakes and symbols and language, codes, all of that jazz? Well, the answer is simple. You take any prominent organization, right? Which one of those ever reveals their trademark secrets and internal systems of operation? None. Or else people would copy them or find out things that the organization wants to keep secret and doesn't want the public to know. So same thing applies 
applies into the Illuminati, you'd use it to your advantage, really. Now, when it comes to politics, specifically American politics, some report that the Illuminati operates as a prominent figure in the United States government. This is because the Illuminati was founded on May 1st, 1776, and the Declaration of Independence of the United States was approved on July 4th, 1776, just two months later. Some say this is totally not a coincidence. Now probably the biggest belief in society right now about the Illuminati is that they are in various forms propagating certain messages to the masses through the media and the use of celebrities, musicians, actors, you name it. And so many celebrities and other popular figures are believed to actually be members of the Illuminati. Now such celebrities are Jay-Z and Beyonce, Adele, Britney Spears, former US President Barack Obama, Lady Gaga, Angelina Jolie, Kanye West, Kim Kardashian, and honestly this list goes on and on and on and on and on. That could be like 50 videos about people who are suspected to be in the Illuminati. Now I have no way of confirming these claims, yet some have been caught on camera using certain hand gestures that it's linked to the Illuminati. But this was just some of the celebrities that have been suspected over the years to be a part of the Illuminati. Starting with fact number 10. Who are the Freemasons or what are Freemasons anyways? Well, Freemasons are a fraternal organization and pretty much what that means is that only men can be admitted as a member. We can also trace the origins of the Freemasons back to the Middle Ages in Europe where they functioned as a guild of skilled stonemasons, hence the name Freemasons. Now the next thing to know about Freemasons at fact number nine is that the first Grand Lodge which was established to govern Freemasonry in England and Wales, it was formed in the year 1717 and this was during a meeting at a pub in the city of London called the Goose and Gridiron. Now at that time there were four lodges in the city but in Scotland a Masonic Lodge in Edinburgh has records to show that it has been in existence since at least 1599. Now, during the early 18th century, Freemasonry spread quickly to Europe and the colonies of Europe. Fact number eight is something that a lot of people that aren't even Freemasons, they know about this. So symbols. Symbols are commonly used and they're seen associated with Freemasons and they're considered to be arcane secrets by many, but they actually are not really that secretive? Well, I'll explain what I mean. So the most popular amongst them is the all-seeing eye, and this is a very old symbol that's used to represent all-knowing quality of God, and it was not designed by Freemasons. This existed way before Freemasons. It wasn't something that they invented, they just adopted it. Also, the square and the compass. This also wasn't something that was invented by the Freemasons, but it represents the art of building and architecture, and the G in the middle of it has a degree of ambiguity that surrounds it, so we're not necessarily 100% clear on what that actually means, but it either represents God or it represents a geometric equilibrium that the entire universe was designed on. And you know, amongst those theories, there's other speculations about it. But there's another symbol of Freemasons that actually takes inspiration from the world of the beehive, as a matter of fact. Masons were originally working men who were supposed to be as busy as bees. We've heard that expression before. And the beehive symbolizes the industriousness of the Freemason Lodge. They're always busy, always active, always up to something. For fact number seven, the Freemasons use a variety of handshakes in order to greet one another. These handshakes are based on a Mason's rank within the organization though. And it's interesting, I have seen actual Freemasons do the handshake in public. I guess they didn't know I was looking, but I saw what they were doing. Either way though, when it comes to handshakes, there are handshakes for each degree. So there's the apprentice, the fellow craft and the master. Each rite has its own handshake, so there is a quite a variety of them. They're used during Masonic ceremonies and as well as I guess that they're used in public because I literally saw them doing one of the handshakes. I knew it, I'm like that's those are Freemasons right there. Moving on to fact number six. Now there is a code of ethics that guides the behavior of Freemasons. This code is taken from several documents and the most famous of these documents are 
actually known as the Old Charges or the Constitutions. One of these documents, by the way, known as the Regis Poem or the Hollowell Manuscript, it actually dates back to sometime around the later part of the 14th century to the early 15th century, somewhere in between there. And it's reportedly the oldest document to mention masonry. And this is according to Petrie Stone Review of Freemasonry. And that's, by the way, is an online magazine that is written by the Freemasons. Continuing with fact number five, initiation for new members requires a long period of training. And during this time, they learn the craft and often are taught advanced math and architecture, among other skills. Now, their skills are in such a high demand that experienced Freemasons were frequently sought out by monarchs or high-ranking church officials. Now, the guilds, they provide members not only with wage protection and quality control over the work that's performed, but also important social connections. That's definitely one of the benefits of being in an organization like Freemasons. You know, you're very, very, very connected. But among other things, members of Freemasonry, they gather in lodges and Freemasons, you know, they socialize, they eat meals together, they gather to discuss events and things like that. Now, I kind of alluded to this next fact, but the early Masonic lodges were exclusively male, meaning that women were completely prohibited from being a member. But over time, as the years went on, women continued to play a very crucial role in the organization, especially in Europe. And the Masonic organizations, they were formed later on in a way that would admit both male and female members. Now, some of these organizations include the Order of the Amaranth. Also, there's the Order of the White Shrine of Jerusalem and the Order of the Eastern Star. In these organizations, both men and women partake in Masonic rites and women can hold positions of authority and leadership. There are some divisions though where it's just exclusively female and some just exclusively male. Although we do have some organizations in Freemasonry that mix. Coming down near to the end of this episode, fact number three, the Catholic Church, they first condemned Freemasonry in the year 1738. And this was prompted by a concern over Masonic temples and secret rituals that were performed inside of them. In the 19th century, the Vatican even called the Masons the synagogue of Satan. This is a quote taken from the last book of the Bible, Revelation. Either way, though, the church went on even further in the year 1983, declaring that their principles have always been considered irreconcilable with the doctrine of the church and therefore membership in them remains forbidden. The faithful who enroll in Masonic associations are in a state of grave sin and may not receive Holy Communion. This is what the church had to say about those who joined Freemasonry. Moving on now to fact number two. Numbers are also very symbolic in Freemasonry. The number three, the number five, and the number seven have very great importance to Freemasons. The number three is another way to express the sacred idea of the triangle or the trinity, the triforce. You know, there's so many different terms to describe three. So with that said, yes, the number three is another symbol for the deity to Freemasons anyways. Now, the number five is representative of the five human senses, the five points of fellowship, and the five-pointed star, and also geometry, which is called the fifth science. Now, Pythagoreans, they consider the number five a mystical number because it is the union of the first even number and the first odd number, symbolizing mixed conditions of order and disorder, happiness and misfortune, as well as life and death. Now, the last fact I want to end off with is actually taking a look at some Masons. Who are some people among us that have lived on this planet that were part of the Freemasons? Well, some famous Freemasons can be found throughout history, as a matter of fact, like George Washington was a master Mason. There's also Benjamin Franklin, and he was a founding member of the first Masonic Lodge in America. Also, President Franklin D. Roosevelt and Gerald Ford were Masons. And then there was Prime Minister of Great Britain, Winston Churchill. Also, the famous composer Mozart was a Mason. Then there is Steve Wozniak, who is the co-founder of Apple. Also, Henry Ford, you know, his name lives on with the Ford cars. He was a Mason. John Wayne, as well as astronaut Buzz Aldrin 
are also Masons. And guys, that is not an exhaustive list. This is just all I wanted to list in the episode, but there's many, many, many more that I could list. Think at number 10, we have Baphomet. Now, the image of Baphomet was originally created back in 1854 by the occultist Eliphaz Levi for his book, Dogmas and Rituals of High Magic. But even before this depiction, Baphomet was a deity that the Knights Templar were accused of worshiping, and then it was incorporated into the occult and mystical traditions. Now, the name Baphomet appeared in the trial transcripts for the Inquisition of the Knights Templar, starting back as early as 1307, and the symbol reflects a number of principles that are considered to be fundamental to occultists. And it was influenced by Kabbalah, Hermeticism, alchemy, as well as other beliefs. Now, Baphomet as a goat face in an inverted pentagram is also a very popular occult symbol. Number nine, we have the Tetragrammaton. Now, you wouldn't really think that this next one would have anything to do with the occult, but it actually does. So God is called by many names in Hebrew, and the word tetragrammaton is a Greek word that means word of four letters. And it was one of the names that the Jews would write down, but they would not pronounce it. It was considered to be too holy to be said by anyone. Now, early Christian transliterators, they pronounced this name Jehovah from the 17th century and beyond. And by the time we got to the 19th century, the word was retransliterated into the word Yahweh. So the letters that make up the Tetragrammaton are Yod, He, Va, and He. Now in English, they're commonly written as Y-H-W-H or J-H-V-H. -H. It's got the J and the Y as well as the V and the W can be translated into the same pronunciation. Now occultists based in Judeo-Christian mythology consider the Hebrew names of God such as Adonai and Elohim to hold a lot of power in them, but none of them hold as much power as the Tetragrammaton. And in the occult, God is most commonly represented by the Tetragrammaton. And even occultists believe that, yeah, you do not say this word. There's so much power in it and people don't even understand the power that is in that word. Even Aleister Crowley was like, yeah, this word is very powerful. But now moving on to number eight, we have the Rosy Cross. The Rosy Cross is often associated with a number of different schools of thought, including the Golden Dawn, the Thelema, the OTO, as well as the Rosicrucians, also known as the Order of the Rose Cross. Now each of these groups have a different type of interpretation of the symbol and they use it in different ways, but this shouldn't be a surprise because magic as well as occult and esoteric symbols are often used to communicate different ideas that you can't really express just in speech. There's often a whole world when it comes to symbols. So every single group, of course, is gonna have a different perspective. Now, a pentagram is displayed at the end of each arm of the cross. And now each of these pentagrams bears a symbol of five elements. There's a wheel for spirit. There's a bird's head that symbolizes air. The zodiac sign for Leo, which is a fire sign. And the zodiac symbol for Taurus, which is is an earth sign, and then there's a zodiac symbol for Aquarius, which is a water sign. This next one probably doesn't come as a surprise to many of you, but the pyramid is here. Now, the pyramid is a key symbol in Freemasonry and reported to be a symbol used by the Illuminati. And this is especially when it's depicted with a separated capstone. So in certain occult circles, the all-seeing eye is thought to refer to a great divide among the people. Now, each level or step of the pyramid represents a socioeconomic class, and the capstone with the eye represents the most elite and their elevated status among the rest of humankind. The Tree of Life is also a very popular occult symbol. It's also called Etz Chaim in Hebrew, and it's a common visual depiction of the 10 Sephiroth of Kabbalah. Each Sephiroth represents an attribute of God through which he manifests his eternal will. Now the tree of life doesn't represent a single sort of system or anything like that, but it can be applied to the formation and existence of both physical as well as metaphysical worlds, as well as to one's own soul and state of being or understanding. On top of that, 
different schools of thoughts like Kabbalistic Judaism as well as modern Western occultism also offer different interpretations of the symbol. Halfway in at number five, we have this one here, the evil eye. The evil eye is a curse that is believed to be cast when you give an evil glare. And it's usually given to a person when they are completely unaware that it's happening. Now, many cultures believe that receiving an evil eye will cause misfortune or some sort of injury. So be careful out there, guys. The evil eye is often sold as jewelry, decoration, among other things. And it was said to be created to protect protect people against the evil eye or evil spirits. Number four brings us the hieroglyphic Monad. Now this is a symbol that was created by John Dee and described in Monas Hieroglyphica or the hieroglyphic Monad back in the year 1564. Now this symbol is intended to represent the reality of the Monad, which is a singular entity from which all material things are said to come from. Now the symbol is constructed from four distinct symbols. There's the astrological signs for the moon and the sun, as well as the cross and the zodiac sign of Aries, the ram, represented by two semicircles at the bottom of the glyph. The oh. symbol at number three is the seal of the truth of God. The Sigillum de Emeth, or the seal of the truth of God, is most widely known through writings and artifacts from John Dee, who was a 16th century occultist as well as an astrologer in the court of Elizabeth I. Now, while the symbol does appear in older text, Dee was actually not happy with them. And so it's believed that he gained guidance from an angel to construct his own version of the symbol. And now Dee's system of angelic magic known as Enochian is heavily rooted in the number seven. And it's a number which is strongly connected to the seven traditional planets of astrology. So with this, the Siligam Dee Ameth is primarily constructed of heptagrams, which are seven pointed stars, and heptagons, which are seven sided polygons. Oh. Now let's take a look at the created universe symbol. Occultists of the Renaissance period, they offer contradictory views of the created universe. And there was a sort of common sense struggle between spirit and matter, where material things are imperfect and contrary to spiritual things, as per modern Christian teachings. And now the illustrator and occult Robert Flood often promoted this view as well and because Christianity envisions God as a tripartite being we have the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost all united within a single Godhead the triangle is commonly used as a symbol for God. Now the upper triangle of this whole symbol here with a tetragrammaton in the middle of it symbolizes the totality of God. And in the lower triangle, we see three circles in it. Now with the center being a solid mass and then the solid mass is actually physical reality and the circles represent the three realms. There's physical, celestial, and angelical. And finally, the occult symbol at number one is the lightning bolt. Yeah, this one was uh, very surprising to me. So satanic worshipers identify this as 777. And this was made popular by Aleister Crowley, who wrote the guide to witchcraft and satanic worship. It's said that Aleister Crowley hated God so much that he named himself 777. Why? Because 666 was already taken. Now, Aleister Crowley's instructions to his followers was that they should learn to speak as well as write and walk backwards so that they can open themselves up to hear the demonic world speak to them. You'll also notice this lightning bolt symbol in the form of the letter S as well. And this is simply because when Lucifer was kicked out of heaven, he fell out of heaven like lightning. And this is according to Jesus in the New Testament of the Bible. And in satanic circles, the symbol represents the destroyer, which Satan is called. 